Hey there everybody, Ryan here from Cataclysm Now and we're doing another engagement scenario. It should be the fourth one. And that's going to be the invasion of Burma. We've got um, units set up here. It's predominantly ground combat with some um, air units mixed in. So a variety of um, potential for interceptions, cap missions, bombing, uh, strafing, etc. Um, this is the first scenario that I sort of ran into difficulties uh, is perhaps a strong word, but by peeling back the onions of the ver this very complicated game, I was running into issues in which I was probably thinking in, um, too much. And when I zoom in here, um, I'll kind of explain my thinking. I'll still do a playthrough, but these are supposed to be teaching scenarios. So um, after trying to figure out my myriad of questions for a couple hours last night, I just sort of said, hey, we're just trying to learn the system here. Um, these aren't necessarily meant to be um, obviously all inclusive of the rules. Um, but when I approach games, I also like to um, basically game out how you are going to win because the, the victory condition is what set it. And I was without fully understanding the entire set of rules and how movement works beyond these small engagement scenarios, um, I was having difficulty sort of grasping how basically the order of operations, who can move, when combat happens, and when the disadvantaged player can move. Um, and essentially, if you play just by the strict game rules, um, it's impossible for the Japanese to win uh, just because with the number of Commonwealth and British units engaged, they can hold up the Japanese for longer than the two battle cycles. Because um, the way I interpret it, that once you are engaged in a hex, you cannot voluntarily leave unless you deactivate and disengage, which those rules aren't really applicable to engagement scenarios and we don't use the battles uh, the BCM markers for engagement so I was diving in and kind of getting into the nitty-gritty um, larger rules and trying to apply them to this this small scenario here and um, I don't think that's um, what Mark uh, Herman intended I think this is just to show ground combat happening in unison with um, the air forces and the different ways that they can interact uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the actual uh, scenario notes. In the fourth scenario here, uh, this two players basically threw me off because if two people played it, um, again, I don't think the Japanese could win. Um, and again, I'm still learning the system. I could be wrong, but I'll just be playing it solo and not playing optimally for the allies. Just to show that the Japanese can capture Angoon and, and to show off um, the system. Um, two battle cycles, obviously just map A. Japanese have advantage with battle cycles, so they will go first. Lighting condition is day, um, which will affect the search values for the air. And then all ground units can move, so it's basically saying everything's activated. And the Japanese have to win by capturing Rangoon by the end of the battle cycle. Any other result is an allied victory. And then we've got the order of battle here. Essentially some strong high troop quality uh, divisions, the 55th and the 33rd for the Japanese and some potent air forces backed up by a myriad of um, medium strength um, divisions for uh, the Indians and the Burmese. I'm not sure if they're actually Burmese troops or they're British troops. Um, but they have abysmal troop ratings of two. Uh, but they, we do have the uh, Army Volunteer Group of Flying Tigers, um, which are pretty potent in here. So we'll go ahead and uh, we'll zoom in and we'll start the playthrough uh, for the invasion of Burma. Okay, here we have the initial setup. We've got those uh, two Japanese divisions at Tavoy. They'll be marching along the coast along the transport route, the railroads. Um, they're probably gonna hit this uh, Burmese division here. Small base at uh, Mulumai. The first uh, 
Yep, we'll do advantage movement. Uh, so basically, they have to capture Angoon, which is this uh, hex here. At this point, I'm not going to be using the uh, force markers. Oh, this engagement scenario is being small enough. Um, they, I don't think that they necessitate the, their use, but I'm finding that even on this small scale, these stacks are already pretty cluttered. Um, so anything beyond the engagement scenarios, I'm definitely going to use the um, force markers and the, the appropriate cheats. Actually, you'll have to because that's how you keep track of who's activated and not activated. But um, again, these engagement scenarios are so stripped down that um, you don't really have to deal with that. So the movement, we'll take the 55th division here. Um, they have a movement of six. So, and it's two along the route. Uh, so they will enter this hex here along with the 33rd will move along as well. I see these stacks are clumsy. All right, next is the advantage air mission. So I'll decide which air missions um, will occur and then we'll resolve those. So these IGN fighters flew from this base here to avoid, uh, skirted around to avoid potential detection and they will be attacking and strafing or attempting to strafe or engage the flying tigers uh, in an air battle and then the bomber unit here is going to be bombing that Burmese uh, division. So we'll go ahead and roll for detection for the allies. So basically they need at daytime they need uh, sixes. So we'll do this combat first. That is an eight so it's undetected so the AVG is caught on the ground. So these fighters, they uh, will do a strafe because uh, their ground, their air attack values on the far left is higher than their ground. And the strafe tables are, yeah, uh, they're more rewarding. They have a higher chance of scoring hits. So I'll go ahead and roll that and it is a one so a one on the strafe value of five three hits yikes that is quite the blow for the volunteer group uh, and then we'll do flak which is just the value of the small base which is one and it's a two, so um, no hits there. So they will go ahead and fly back. I'm going to do the same procedure here. See if they're detected. It's a six, so they are detected, uh, which means Flack will be able to fly, fire first. There is a small base buried underneath that stack of units. The one, it's a seven, no go. Uh, so we will go ahead and do uh, a ground attack value of five. And it is a five. A five or five is most likely troop check, troop quality. Uh, so that Burmese division needs a two or less. Oh, and they, uh, they got a two. So they actually, oops, they survived that. Uh, if they had failed it, they would have been broken, and then it would have been much easier for the Japanese army units there uh, to inflict damage. Um, the, this bomber unit could fly back and land on this air installation, but because it only has a launch value of six, um, only one of these would basically be able to take off. And because they have the range, we'll go ahead and fly back to this large base here. So from here, we'll go ahead and do ground combat. All right, so here we have the 55th and the 33rd attacking uh, the Burmese division. 
go ahead and uh, figure out the attacking differential. Uh, troop quality differential. So we have a six going as a two, and so that is 15, and slide over by two because that is uh, we're on a jungle or a hex that has a river. Um, and so from there, it will be uh, rolling on the 13 column. And go ahead and roll. It is a four. Uh, so we'll go ahead and bring over to the results over here. So we're going to have uh, a four on the 13 column, which is going to be one hit for the attacker and three on the defender with a mandatory retreat. So one has to go on the lead unit, so that four actually becomes a five. And they become, and they have three hits. Now the Burmese unit, after taking hits, has to roll for uh, its troop quality check. It is a seven, which fails, which means this unit is broken. And so from here, this is where the interesting thing happens. So if I mean, it would make sense to retreat the unit into uh, this unit so that, or into this hex, so that potentially we could shield the um, uh, this air group. But since they've already moved, they'll go ahead and fall back here. But uh, the, the issue I was mentioning earlier is that, so now these Japanese units are going to move into this hex and that will be all they can do for attacking and moving this turn so the dilemma becomes now on the disadvantage player's turn they can move and they can potentially move a unit from rangoon into this space and when that happens from what i can tell from the ground combat rules is that you can't move out of a um, a hex that has units, enemy units occupying it, unless you're sort of deactivating. So essentially, you know, if this is two battle cycles long, I can't, I don't know mechanically how the Japanese can attack if the allies adopt that position. Now, because I'm playing solo, you know, I'm not going to play that way just to illustrate the ground combat rules. But if you were playing this two player, I just feel like it's dead on arrival, unless there's something I'm grossly misunderstanding or, or missing in, in the rules, uh, which again, I may be just going and reading way too deeply into this. This is probably just an exercise just to practice, um, you know, ground combat and some air combat, which is what I'm interpreting it as. Um, but that's where it gets a little, a little uh, difficult, at least for me in that moment. So they are gonna fall back just to defend Rangoon because that'll be the best option. Um, because the uh, volunteer group will be able to fly out with the uh, disadvantage air missions. Um, they'll be able to fly, hit something, which they'll probably do here in a second. So um, the Japanese do have the opportunity to pursue. That's another reason why the, um, the Burmese division probably didn't want to fall back there. If they pursue, they have to roll their, uh, do a troop, troop quality check. Not, well, yeah, not going to do that there. I'm just going to keep it simple. Um, and But if you do do the pursuit uh, and it's successful, then the um, retreating unit has to take half of the losses that they just took, round it down again. So they would have to take another step loss. Step loss but um, not not going to simulate that here. Um, so again, I'm just already trying to drive and dive into this strategy. Be like, well, I don't want to fall back here, so I wouldn't want the 55th to pursue. Um, but if I fell back here, then the 55th could pursue. But then on the allies next turn, they can move units forward. And again, not knowing all the rules in terms of linking and isolation, and the, which is the equivalent of supply in this game, um, 
I'm just reading too much into it. <laughs> so I'm just going to play this through. Quit rambling and uh, play this through. So we'll go ahead and do at least disadvantage air movement um, to see if they can potentially disrupt. Um, maybe do a ground attack against one of these or potentially disrupt. Now we'll go with it disrupting uh, that fighter unit there. May not be the best idea because they do have three hits on them, um, but they're still going to do it. So roll for Japanese detection, and it is a three, and they are detected, so they're going to scramble, and we will go ahead and have cap combat. So basically both roll at each other with um, basically a five versus a three. So the advantage combat-wise is on the Japanese. Ooh, the allies roll a two, and the Japanese roll a three so hits are simultaneous so we'll do the uh, AVG first say so they rolled a two on a three which is a cap versus it's automatic cord um, not strike oh, it's a coordinate strike yep so it's gonna be one so they're gonna suffer one hit and then the Japanese have a three on a five, and that is going to be a hit as well um, against that air group. Is this a ball of four? Yeah, it is. Okay. So some damage there. Uh, so they flew from here. So that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'll go ahead and back here now again if we were playing probably in the battle or scenario campaign it wouldn't be leaving these airfields open but hell this is practice all right so from there we'll go at the beginning of the next battle cycle which is advantage movement and again we are just going to pile in all um, both these divisions uh, and attack Rangoon proper. So we'll go ahead and just lay these guys out. Get the camera here. The big battle. They are broken versus. All right, so before this uh, big thing, we are going to go ahead and uh, this um, bombing unit is going to fly into Rangoon and they are going to hit, which most likely will be the lead unit, which will be the 17th Indian. No, actually the most likely lead unit is going to be um, the 4th Rangoon. So they're going to want to try to disrupt that. So we'll roll for detection. And it's a zero, so they are detected. So flak goes first. Flak value is going to be one, two, then three. One, two, three, and then one for the base. So it's actually going to be four. Actually, let me double check that. Yep, we'll be adding all four. And it's a seven, so none of the flak hits. So we are going to roll for a five against that Rangoon regiment. And that is a zero. So a zero on a five for a air versus ground unit is a troop quality check. Ah, which is an eight, so it fails it. So it paid off. I'll have to get another broken token here that will that may be enough to hamper um, or shift the combat results table enough for an easy overrun all right so he'll fly back to Saigon and uh, from what I understand from the rules, um, a hex can only be the target of one 
air mission. So this could not also pummel the same. I guess they could strike some of the... Um... Actually, just for shits. Um, and uh, just to practice the air combat a little more, we'll launch these fighters against uh, the AVG again. Um, I think I should probably declare that before the results of the other one, but oh well. So we'll roll for detection. It's a three, so it is detected. They will go ahead and scramble and we'll do cap. Uh, fire simultaneous. Okay, I think I forgot to do flak for the base there. Um, but I'll make sure to do it for this one. Ooh, zero for the Americans, nine for the Japanese, so nothing. So a zero for air combat, which is actually a two. Zero and a two. Coordinated cat versus coordinated mission. So that will be an additional hit on the Japanese. And then we'll roll for black, which is a two. So nothing additional there. Fruitless mission. All right, we'll go ahead and prep for the, um, the ground battle here. Also another item, when a base is uh, overrun and there's no engin accompanying engineer unit, it's also removed. Um, if there's no mobile ground units. So for here, we're gonna have the lead units of the 55th again, with the, which is a troop quality of six versus um, the 17th Indian which is a troop quality of two. And so again, we're at 15 and same, uh, we'll be rolling on the 13 uh, combat result or the, the 13 column based off of the troop quality differential. And so for here, we're looking for a mandatory retreat. So they have to control um, the hex. So we'll go ahead and roll. It is a six, and a six on the 13 is a mandatory. One of the size is definitely 17 plus. So it's two and three hits. Uh, so they have to take, they go all the way up to seven. Let me see if I find the seven. Oh my God, here we go. They take seven hits and two hits on that. So that becomes a seven as well. But it's a mandatory retreat. So we have to roll um, a true quality check uh, for the Indian division. And if they fail, then they're gonna to have to uh, retreat one and basically seed uh, the hex to the Japanese. All right, we'll go ahead and roll for the troop quality. Basically the, the entire fate of the campaign hinges on this die roll. So we need two or less and it's a nine. So the rest of the units become broken as well. and must retreat one hex. And as you can see, this has already become <laughs> ridiculously tall. <laughs> so for sure, we'll be doing the force markers going forward. This base is eliminated. This is there. The Japanese were able to pull off their victory just in time at the end of the second battle cycle. Um, so absent playing the other side as the, to the best of my ability in terms of launching attacks into the teeth of the um, Japanese advance for the sake of scoring or, or running out the clock. Um, the Japanese still have to run the gamut. They essentially have to overrun uh, and force a retreat on that uh, first uh, Burmese division. Uh, and then their second attack they have to do 
a forced retreat as well. So they're going to be rolling in the red uh, for the combat results table, which so they'll basically just have to be they have to score hits along here. Um, so with the troop differentials we're talking about in the 13 column, so yeah, there's about a 33% chance that it won't work out over two. But you can help mitigate that by using the air units to hit what are potentially the the, the deadliest and the best of the um, ground troops or the ones that you anticipate are going to be part of the uh, the lead units and if you can hit those and break them uh, which will drastically reduce the troop quality because those are halved uh, which will make it for the easier for the Japanese um, to overrun so another great little scenario despite the little uh, hiccups in terms of uh, absorbing the new rules but again I think I was just diving into it a little too um, intensely uh, the next scenario is similarly ground themed and it's going to be uh, in the same theater, it's going to be the uh, battle, battles of Impal and Kohima, which is in 44, um, March 44, while this is in uh, February uh, 42. So, again, these scenarios are fun, a uh, little treat, and I can you know, still want to uh, plow through the rest of them. So, if you're still watching, uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll go ahead and catch you guys on the next one.